So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to listen to this session. I'm Carolyn Pepper. I'm um, chair of the leaders group or co-chair of the leaders group, um, the D Disability Business Inclusion Group here at Reed Smith. And I honestly, I can't tell you how excited I am about this session. I mean, I mean sometimes people say that and maybe they don't mean it, but I really mean it <laughs> because I've had the, the, the good fortune of having a few, um, a few sessions speaking to these, these wonderful people, that, the panelists that we've got here. And they are incredibly inspiring people, I have to say. I've been absolutely blown away just on the, the, the chats we've been able to have so far. So I am so excited to have you here with us. Um, I'm just going to hand it, we're going to talk a bit about kind of intersectionality, I think, during the course of this. So although it's a talk on, on allyship, um, that's not going to be the entirety of what we're talking about. We've got lots of different um, diversity um, the diversity criteria here. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that during the course of this session. So the session's title is or is a leader's framework to allyship, leveraging influence and privilege. And so the, the, the kind of, the kind of thought, pro thought process is to all rise means in part leading inclusively and engaging in consistent allyship. And in this session, the panelists are going to discuss what allyship is, what it isn't, who can be an ally and the benefits of allyship. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Thor, who's going to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Carolyn. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Thor Malouf. Um, I'm from the London office where I work in transportation and I also help to run the RS Vets Business Inclusion Group. And I'm so excited and pleased to introduce our panel to you today. So I'll start uh, with Linda. This is Judge Linda Monain. Um, uh, Linda began her career as a Airman Basic, so that's the lowest enlisted grade in the Air Force, but she retired as a Colonel in 2004. Linda put herself through night school while raising a young family and working full time in the Air Force at the same time. And she served as the Chief Court Management Service Section at the Special Tribunal for the Lebanon uh, in Liedenstam among her many achievements in her legal career in the military. And she has now uh, taken up a position as a judge in the Marshall Islands. So, Linda, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm sorry for you know, not being able to list all of your many and exciting achievements. So please do carry on and introduce yourself a little bit more. So, um, as Thor mentioned, well, first I want to thank Thor, Joanne, Luke, Carol, Karen, and Elise, um, who made it possible for me to be here. It, take a, it took a village to get us all here. <laughs> yes. And I, I hope I remembered everyone. Um, and I'm very grateful to everyone who helped me be on this panel today. Um, as I shared, uh, as Thor shared, I enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1974 as an Airman Basic E1, which is the lowest enlisted grade. I did not have a degree. In 1974, when women enlisted, women only enlisted in the United States Air Force. They had to surrender their children for adoption before they could come on active duty. And as soon as they got pregnant, they were fired. It was in that environment that I eventually got my undergraduate degree within two years of enlisting, then went on to go to night law school at Loyola, New Orleans, commuting 800 miles a week, 200 miles a night, four nights a week as a second lieutenant after work and eventually got my degree, my JD degree. Uh, I got my commission, got my JD degree, became a judge in 1994, including three years as the chief trial judge for Europe, uh, which is the best job in the global universe, being the chief trial judge for the United States Air Force in Europe. That was from 2000 to 2003. So when the planes hit the trade towers in New York, I became responsible for all the then um, occupied uh, combat zones for the United States government. Uh, United States Air Force, I'm sorry. Um, and so I tried cases in Oman, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, where although I could be the judge in Saudi Arabia, I could not drive a car. Um, so lots of things that I experienced as one of, when I came to the bench, I was one of only, only two women in the entire Air Force on the bench. Um, but I'm also 100% totally and permanently disabled vet. Uh, at this point in my career, I did work for the United Nations for eight years, including five years doing war crimes cases at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and three years at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, where we tried five Hezbollah indicted for the assassination of the former Prime Minister Rafi Kariri. And indeed, as Thor points out, 
I'm about to take off for my next grand adventure as a totally and permanently disabled person. I'm going to be an associate justice on the High Court of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So I think that kind of brings you up to speed. Thank you so much. <laughs> And we also have with us uh, Captain Roy Love. And Captain Love serves as the president of the Association of Naval Services Officers, uh, ANSO, which conducts recruitment and outreach within America's underserved communities. And Captain Love was also the first Dominican and Afro Latino to command a naval US warship. So thanks for joining us, Roy. Please continue to introduce yourself. Can you all hear me? All right. So thank you for having me here, Thor and uh, the team. I mean, amazing support, better than the Navy ever did for us traveling TAD. So you guys are rocking it there. Um, I, I also enlisted in the Navy uh, when I was 18 years old. I came in as an E1, but I got promoted in boot camp to E2. So, you know, meritorious promo promotion, which was, which was excellent at that time. Um, I served uh, 29 years and six months on active duty. I uh, went to a Merchant Marine Academy for four years, so I served 34 years in uniform, um, working with young men and women in, in the services, which is my passion. And so after getting out of the military, it was easy to jump into a job where that's what we do. We take care of the primarily Hispanic and Latinos in the sea services, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps to help them grow, develop professionally, reach the highest ranks possible, and also to help the services recruit those, those young minorities, talented young men and women who can serve within our sea services. Um, for me, the journey in the military was awesome. It was, it was just excellent. And to be here today talking to you about that journey uh, is, is very special because without allies, I would have never made it. Mm. So. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And it's, it's clear already that this panel is going to have so, so much insight on our discussion today and we're really honored that you've all joined us and last but definitely by no means least uh this is uh scott calder colonel scott calder retired uh, of the u.s air force and scott has been a, a medic throughout his career and his he's devoted his work to helping uh those in the services with disabilities to adapt uh well in order for their duties to be adapted to get them back into service and to keep wounded warriors uh, employed in, in the service as much as possible. So thank you very much, Scott. Please do go ahead and introduce yourself further. Thanks. Uh, so it's been a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, like Roy, I was uh, in the military for quite a long time, 35 years total, uh, 28 and a half in, uh, on active duty. Uh, I was a general surgeon at first and transitioned into leadership about halfway through my career. Uh, and as is often the case in the military, you keep getting bigger and bigger jobs. Um, and so it, my last three jobs were uh, pretty complicated, but a big part of what we did was uh, look at why uh, or what issues people are having medically and whether the, uh, we can adapt and figure out how to allow them to continue to serve or sometimes the risk to them or the risk to our mission is too much that we have to help them transition, uh, which the work doesn't end then, of course, because then the VA takes over uh, and helps them further transition if uh, medically it's appropriate. So that's uh, was my last three jobs, uh, part of my last three jobs and uh, look forward to discussing it. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, I mean, I think we all agree we, we do have just such amazing experience in terms of or, and diverse experience in, here in front of us. So we've got so much to learn. I've learned so much already from these panelists. So I know you all will, too. Um, so the topic of this panel, we first of all, was kind of inspired by the Invictus Games and the U.S. equivalent, the Warrior Games. And in those programs, um, people from one diverse groups, veterans, and particularly veterans with disabilities, they've used their platform to promote and highlight issues surrounding the wider acceptance of disability sport. So in a sense, vets with dis disabilities are allying and advocating for the wider community of people with disabilities. So I want to ask, I'm gonna ask you, Roy, first of all, um, how can allyship from one, from one diverse group benefit another diverse group? Oh, wow. So in so many ways. I've been doing this for so long. Um, 
So I'm Dominican, I grew up in the Caribbean, right? Most people make an assumption that I grew up in a poor place. I lived in New York, I lived in the Bronx. Uh, I didn't grow up poor. My dad was a rich white man who just happened to be Puerto Rican. Um, and in the Caribbean, when you have money, you're privileged. You're very privileged. So we grew up with servants, with um, chauffeurs, nannies, went to Abraham Lincoln School, all English school in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. and. So I grew up in an intersection of two worlds. My mom is black and you know, Hispanic, uh, native and white, mixed, very mixed. And my dad's family is all white, uh, very rich. Growing up in that world helped me see things from two different perspectives, right? And my entire life I've been dedicated to helping others grow. And so coming into the military at first, initially, I didn't see a lot of that allyship, that support. And on my ships, being one of, or usually the only Hispanic uh, officer or Afro Latino officer, uh, because there weren't many of us, was an opportunity to help, to support and take care of everybody that worked under me or worked on that ship. And it didn't matter where you were from. So being able to, to be in a position where you can influence and help others grow significantly improved the command kind of um, what we call the, the morale, right? How people behave. And I saw this on my own ship as a Navy captain, right? I am the only Afro-Latino captain at the time on any ship. And I, there hasn't been another one until a friend of mine, Tony Ten, who also happens to be Dominican, actually took command of his own ship. We are in a unique position to understand the culture of the young Latino, Hispanic men and women that were coming up behind us and help to get them moving in the right direction. Many young Latino officers were leaving the military, the Navy in particular, because they didn't have that support and they weren't well understood. And so being given that opportunity for all of us is, is a tremendous responsibility and one that we have to take seriously. If it wasn't for my white captains who took care of me though, I would have never made it to that position. And so I also needed allies to be able to be in the place to help others, to be an ally to others, right? When, when we're in that position and someone gives us a hand and helps us and with fitness reports or evaluations that say, this is one of my top people and they need to be promoted and advocates for you, right? You rise. And I love the theme of your, of your, uh, your pro program this year, all rise, because together we can rise. It does take someone to reach down and give us a hand though, right? When that ladder is too steep or that, that, that climb is too high, if someone at the top isn't reaching down to say, come with me, let me help you come up, then we will not rise. People will stay stuck. And so as an ally, as a person in a position of power, because to be an ally, you have to have some power and influence, right? You can't just be next to me and say, I'll help you and I'll try and push you up, right? I need to be able to have some sort of influence. When you're given that opportunity, look at everybody from the same lens. We're all human. Each and every one deserves an opportunity to get further in our lives and in our careers. And one of the big things that I did when I was a, the captain of the Naval Base San Diego, which is the second largest Naval base in the world, uh, 50,000 people every day coming in and out. Uh, I had a 400 man police department. In that police department, my leaders were all male right? From the chief of police to uh, everybody. And so when we would have meetings, they would come just all the men and no women ever. And I said, one third of our police department is women. Why is it that you never bring uh, one of your uh, female officers or, or chiefs to these meetings? And I just looked around like, oh, well, we never thought about that. Well, guess what changed? After that, we started to bring in more women to the meetings with the captain so that they would take the word back to the other ladies that worked in the department. And they would feel a lot more comfortable about what was being done. It was no longer a male dominated world. And they were able to actually affect many changes. Before you know it, we had someone apply to a senior position, a woman applied to a senior position in the police department. She came in and life changed for everybody. It was so much better. So I think that's a little bit of how you can do that. Thank you so much. Uh, Linda, do you want to? Well, I want to go back to the opening today um, where the comments were made that in order for someone who doesn't look like you 
doesn't think like you or has different abilities than you may have. Advancing them does not mean you have to disadvantage someone else. And and I can't agree with that statement more. But I have to tell you, okay, so we need a little humor. Everybody needs to laugh. And so when I came in the Air Force in 74, there were no pant uniforms for women. Um, my my uh, fatigue uniform was a wraparound skirt. No kidding. It was a wraparound skirt. And you can't imagine what it's like doing sit-ups and push-ups on the field in a wraparound skirt. But it's a lot of fun, especially when there's a good stiff, stiff, stiff breeze in Texas, okay? Um, so, and... and Uh, Roy, when you talk about uh, the ladder to success, I actually had a card on my desk that used to say, on the ladder to success, the man above you is stepping on your fingers, the man below you is looking up your skirt. Mm. Okay, so um, the ladder of success was that way in many respects for women in the military when I came in. Um, So I, I am a cisgender female heterosexual, and a second-generation European-American. I believe that the question about how can persons from one um, affinity group or one uh, group help advance the cause of another. In my role as a military judge, I was obliged, and I was a judge for 10 years, I was obliged to apply the law as it was, not the way I would like it to be. That is your obligation as a judge, something that our current judiciary might take a look at. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so um, I was required to preside at hearings involving individuals whose only uh, disparity in obeying the requirements of the service was that they had announced that they had a same gender partner because I was a judge during the period of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a Clinton administration era uh, policy that was intended to be, allow individuals who were LGBTQ plus to stay in the service, as long as they just didn't act on their sexual orientation. I'm not exactly sure what that's about, but that was the rule. And I was obliged to preside at cases that involved Uh, discharging individuals who, for whatever reason, felt they had to say that they had a same-gender partner or to bring them to an event, bring their partner to an event. I I can't, I I get goosebumps thinking about having had to preside at those cases and having had their lives changed, seeing them out of the service. But it was my obligation as a judge to apply the law as it was, not as I would have liked it to be. And so, although I'm a female disabled, I've spent a good deal of my time in the LGBTQ plus bar because I am a member of the LGBTQ plus bar, although I am plus at the end, um, trying to help those service members for whom discharge was required by virtue of announcing their gender orientation, their uh, sexual orientation, um, and trying to help them get discharges upgraded helping them get uh, re-enlistment codes removed, and helping them get the GI Bill benefits. So how can one individual from one group help another group? Do something. Don't just show up the meetings. Organize pro bono efforts. Encourage the change that you would have liked to have seen when you were in the situation where you couldn't change it, and now you can. Um, And you can be a very effective advocate using your label from one group to assist the, and support another group in their efforts. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you very much. And, and I know that um, you've already been speaking to Alan York about the possibility of doing some pro bono work in relation to some of those discharges. So if there's anybody in the room who's interested in doing that, please go and speak to Alan because uh, Linda's, Linda and Alan are going to try and work together, I think, to try and do some more work around that. So yeah, thank you very much. And, and congratulations up from your work in this area. And it's, it's great to hear actually you talking about 
um, Roy also, uh, when we've spoken a few times, um, just saying that the greatest privilege really is to lift people up from f f who have not had the opportunities you are, you've had or who are, who are junior to you. The, one of the greatest privileges in life is to lift people up. So I think um, that's fantastic. And I think that really embodies what all three of our panelists are about here. So, so thank you. Um, Scott, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so you, you started this with a comment about the Warrior Games and the Invictus Games. And uh, I think there's a lot of lessons from those games. Uh, th there's the obvious one that uh, those games show what people with obvious uh, disabilities or, and prosthesis and whatnot can do. But the reality is there's a lot of folks who participate in those games who also have uh, non-visible injuries or non-visible uh, illnesses who also participate. And, uh, and, and I think we often forget about those folks as well. So it's an, an important reminder just that uh, there's, all, there's a whole spectrum of uh, potential issues uh, out there to look at. The other thing uh, that's important about the Warrior Games is it's, uh, it was started by John Warden, who was just some guy. And it was not started by the Department of Defense. And in fact, the first five years, it was not run by the Department of Defense. It was run by John Warden and his charity and uh, the US Olympic Committee and a bunch of other uh, sponsorships. And of course, the military was heavily involved, but they, they, they weren't running it. Uh, they now run it and uh, probably the way it should have been from the beginning. But you know, it's a great example of one guy really can make a difference. And, uh, and, and so it doesn't always have to be those top guys who have a lot of influence, and a lot of ability. Sometimes it's just tenaciousness uh, and doing the right thing. Uh, and then the final thing I'll point out is uh, the Invictus Games, I feel like, are really, really well known. Uh, and the Warrior Games, I bet you average America has never heard of the Warrior Games. And, uh, and it's just, we have not done a good job of, of talking about it. Why is the Warrior Games uh, not on television? You know, and, and seeing, even if it was a single hour segment, just show a little bit of it some Saturday afternoon, but we don't do that. Uh, and so there's still lots of, of room to uh, improve in, in everything we do but certainly in the Warrior Games, because uh, the Brits have certainly done, a or the UK has done a great job with the, uh, with the Invictus Games and really promoting it. Uh, so it's, it's a great uh, venue for sure and lots of lessons to be learned there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Cool. So we had a next question for you all, which was how can one as an individual use their position to be an ally or a change agent? And I know that each of you have actually uh, very helpfully uh, already touched on that in your answers to the first question. But I wondered whether any of you have some tips or pointers for anyone watching or listening today um, to them as individuals. What could, what from your experience do you think, if you heard now, uh, it, you know, would spur you to, to sort of go for it and, and stand up and be that ally and you know do that bit of advocacy. Are there any tips and pointers from your experience that you think you could add? Um, maybe Roy, you could Yeah, so, so I was thinking about that. Um, yesterday on the plane, a young man was sitting next to me and there was another young lady next to him. And he was telling her a story about how he went to this club uh, in a hotel, I guess, and uh, they wouldn't let him in the front door. Uh, they told him, are you, I asked him, are you a member of this club? And he said, no. And then he said, well, then you have to use the other entrance. And he says to her, I feel like a second class citizen. Right? Think about living your entire life as a second class citizen when you're a minority in this country. And wherever you go, you have to prove yourself and prove that you belong in that room. Right? Who's standing next to you that says, oh, no, they belong. And I, I think most of us have heard stories of people in a restaurant or somewhere where someone has stood up right after someone has been um, biased towards them and said, oh, this person belongs here. Right? And that happened to me a couple of times in the military where and I'm wearing a uniform and, you know, we our uniforms tell uh, the rank that you are. And so I'm in uniform with someone who's junior to me and someone walks up and introduces himself to the junior person. Right. They don't see me. And so that junior person says, no, he's the captain. Oh, and one time I actually went and showed up to a, uh, an event that I was, I personally volunteered my time as the captain of the base to escort this group of Navy League personnel. 
I got there, I'm in uniform, I walk up, this gentleman is obviously leading the group because he's the one talking the most and going back and forth, doesn't say anything to me. When my public affair officer shows up, he goes straight up to her and says, yeah, we've been waiting for the captain. <laughs> and she's like, but he's right there. And I was, I've been there 10 minutes. Oh, you're the captain. Uh, you look kind of young to be the captain. That's what he said. You know what that means, right? You don't look kind of young to be the captain. I didn't see you because I expected someone who looked different than you. When we're in those spaces and when we're in those situations, those of us who are in the, in the position that is not being acknowledged, most of the time we'll say nothing. We'll suck it up. We'll say it just, it is what it is. This is how we live, right? It is incumbent upon each and every one of us to notice those, especially if we're the ones that's doing it, right? Are we the ones being ignoring the person in the room? So for me as a male walking into a room and there's a senior uh, officer who's a woman, right? I don't turn to the man next to her first. I acknowledge her presence and I acknowledge her authority and that what she's earned, right? That's an opportunity for each and every one of us to be paying attention and to do the right thing, to be a true ally when it comes to acknowledging what people have done, the things they have accomplished and the positions that they have earned. It's the same in a room where you walk in and the majority of the group is the same and there's someone who is a little bit different. Do we choose to sit next to that person who's different or choose to sit somewhere else? Because sometimes they're sitting by themselves and no one will approach them into many parties where I have looked for the person that seemed isolated and alone to walk up to them first and introduce myself and say hello, make them feel welcome and part of that team. I think that's what allyship is really about. It goes beyond that because when you're really a true ally, you're, you're wanting that person to succeed and you wanna make sure that you do everything to help them succeed because you have no idea who's not helping and who's you know putting them down and then when someone does speak ill or badly about that person step up to the plate right and say that's wrong I th and i think we hear that all the time but it's a lot harder to do sometimes we get in in that space where i just i don't have the time for this so you have to make the time for it so do the right thing thank you roy all really good points and uh, scott or linda do you have any points to add yeah, so I loved it this morning when I heard, you know, it's important to set goals. I think most people get that. I loved it even more when I heard and watch those goals and see how you do. And then I loved even more and set goals that are hard because uh, I feel like so often we set goals we know we can achieve uh, and it's it gets to small incremental improvements instead of the, some of the really big th things that can happen. But what we don't talk a lot about, though, is uh, lifting people up uh, rather than groups of people. And uh, it, one of the hardest things as a leader is to really get to know your people. Uh, it requires a lot of effort. You know, how many of us have had bosses, the only time they've ever left the executive area is to go to their car. Uh, and I made a purpose uh, every day, I would walk in the building a different way and I'd walk out the building a different way. And every time I went to a meeting or something, I would go wander through some work area rather than just down the regular hall. Uh, and it's it's tough. It's awkward at times. You know, the very first day I was the commander of the hospital at Aviano, uh, I'm walking down the family practice hallway and this airman walks out, sees me and does an about face and walks the other direction. And uh, her sergeant later that day told me, yeah, she came up to me and she said she saw you and she crapped her pads. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's unfortunately the bias that happens because that guy is a boss and he could be a bad guy. Uh, and he has a lot of power. And so I've got to watch out for that person. So that's what it, it takes some time because I'll tell you my best intelligence in that organization and all my organizations were from her and people like her where they would see me in the hall and instead of turning around, they would walk up to me. I hadn't even intended to talk to that person and they walk up and they tell me things and I learn about them and I learn about our organization, which is super important. And I learned that Oh, did you know that, you know, we're not really doing, you know, it, it's never so overt as, you know, only white guys get to do these things. But you pick up the sense that that's, that kind of stuff is going on. But you also learn about those people and, and that, well, you know, I, I grew up in a small town in Louisiana and I, I you know, I'm never going to become anything big. Well, you can help those people and in a very public way say, 
hey, you can climb to greatness, you know, or you can become an officer because you have everything that's, that's required to become an officer. But it all starts with, you have to know those people because if you just promote an entire group, you're going to get failures that you could have predicted by really knowing the folks. And so that's, a, I think, a really key part of allyship is knowing who it is you're helping more than just, you know, the skin color or the gender or the, the sexual preference or any category, including redheaded. So um, I'm going to ask you all to do a little exercise right now, including those of you who are online. So go to the gallery view if you're online. Don't go to the speaker view mm -hmm. and don't just look at yourself. I want you to look around the room, whether it's virtual or real. I want you to look around the room. And I want you to ask yourself who is not in the room. I don't need a name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to know which groups have not been included in the room. <laughs> Where is the woman wearing a hijab? Where is the Sikh? Where is the blind person? Where is the person who's using TTY or uh, using some kind of hearing assisted device to participate today? Where are the African Americans? where who who is missing from the room whether it's virtual or real and then the second question i want you to ask is why aren't they here what barriers were put in the way because you know they want to be here you know they want to be as captain love pointed out they don't want to have to use the back door. They want to be here. So what has happened that means that they aren't in the room today, virtual or real? And let me just tell you in the field of disability, go to a federal courthouse, any federal courthouse. Try to get in the door if you're using a wheelchair. I invite you to try. Go ahead, try. See what you can do. See if your federal courthouse, the key to federal justice in the United States, is accessible to people using wheelchairs. Let me give you another example. Go to that same federal courthouse and after an hour and a half decide you have to use the restroom in a wheelchair. And how do you get there? Who is not in the room? And what barriers have you put in place that prevents them from being in the room? If you have an individual who's LGBTQ+, but they're afraid to tell you that, what barriers have you put in place that make it impossible for them to be out and proud? What have you done to help fix that? What have, not what has the organization done? I'm asking, what have you done? I'm asking, what have I done? And one of the things I've done a lot of work in, as the result of having been outside of my white privilege comfort <coughs> zone at least twice in my life, is I have tried to make sure that I factor in how easy it is for a European American to walk in anywhere they want. I lived three years in Japan. I didn't have white privilege in Japan. <laughs> I had people coming up and touching my hair. I had blonde eyes and, and uh, blonde hair and blue eyes and nobody around me did. It was a very different experience. I worked in Rwanda following the genocide. I was not the predominant person in that culture. And I learned a lot about asking who is not in the room and what are the barriers. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to immerse yourself in a different kind of environment, I think that's another really positive step that you can take to ensure that you are living diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can I, can I say something real quick? Because you, you reminded me of an incident and I related it to the group before about just that. It's not the responsibility of our leaders alone to ensure that we're being inclusive, right? That we ensure that we're being allies. It's each and every one of us who is responsible for this. And 
And uh, just to give you a quick example, when I was running Naval Base San Diego, there was a building that people worked in that had two floors. It's 1940s building, right? Built in World War II. It had been modified uh, for offices. Uh, there was no elevator. Um, they used to have one of those little chair lifts that went up. So the group that worked in the building hired a, a lady who was in a wheelchair. Uh, and so they were working on the second floor instead of first floor. They knowing there was no wheel, the, the wheelchair lift didn't work, there's no elevator, still hired someone in a wheelchair. They wanted us, the leaders in the, in the organization, to solve the problem. So I literally went to this building with the uh, commander who, who was in, in charge of this group to walk through the building, see if there was a way that we could modify the building to accommodate because we're required by law to provide uh, What's it called? Appropriately uh, accommodation. Yes. Well, it turns out there are empty offices in the on the bottom floor. So if you hire someone understanding that they have a, a need for a, a ramp and an elevator, but your building isn't designed for that, the burden should not fall on the, on the unit when on, on, on the leadership of the building to spend $250,000 to create an elevator. When the entire group, which consisted of about three or four people, could have easily moved to the bottom floor to accommodate their new teammate. So where's the allyship there? Where's the requirement to be an ally, a true ally? They were refusing to change offices because they were comfortable in the second floor and they wanted everybody else to make the changes after hiring without really telling us ahead of time, oh, by the way, we're hiring someone with a wheelchair who may require this. Uh, so literally, Three commanders are walking through this building uh, with an executive director at a much higher level to decide whether or not to build an elevator when the answer could have easily come from the group, right? The co-workers who said, we will all move to accommodate our new uh, member. That would have been, it was that, it was literally that easy. Empty offices, move your stuff down and support them. But sometimes we have an expectation that someone else is going to solve the issue and solve the problem when it is within our grasp. We need to understand those instances when we can all be part of the solution and not create bigger problems when they don't really have to be. And, and you remind me also of one other point I wanted to make uh, where you can individually make a difference. So how many of you in the virtual room, how many of you in this room have ever had to do a project <laughs> and you went to look at who you were going to assign to the project? And how often was it the usual suspects, mm. the same people over and over and over again? Why? Because you got good results. So I urge you to challenge yourself to add somebody new, mm. to add somebody who doesn't think exactly like you do. One of the things that happened when we went to COVID and everybody had to go virtual everything is that in the judiciary, we didn't have a lot of people who were deaf, hard of hearing, or blind. We didn't have a lot of people in the judiciary who were deaf, hard of hearing, and blind. And we didn't invite a lot of people to the table who were deaf, hard of hearing, or blind, who were going to have to now use a virtual platform. And so the usual way in which those of you who are litigators, either online or here, present a case included probably some use of visual aids. So when you pivoted to a virtual hearing, guess what the blind person needed to be able to be as effective as they had been live in the courtroom? They needed special technology and a bit more time so that the visual aid that was being shown on a screen that they could not see would actually be communicating to them as it might be in the courtroom through other tools that they had available. But if you don't have those people at the table when you do the pivot, guess what? You don't think about that. And so judges were scheduling hearings for exactly one hour as they used to when they really needed an hour and a half. And oh, by the way, if you didn't have TTY or real-time transcriptionists in the courtroom, you needed one because you might have somebody who was deaf or hard of hearing that was on that virtual platform trying to do a hearing and represent someone. And the right of your client, whoever they may be, to have adequate representation, the best possible representation, didn't change because we went virtual. 
And so when you look around at who you're going to have at the table, when you make those urgent decisions to pivot, ask who's not at the table so that you can make sure that the technology you provide ensures that your client individually is getting the best representation even after the pivot. Thanks so much, Linda. And I think, you know, you've really challenged us there, you know, and I think what's been really good is you're challenging us both as a, a firm or a group of people and indeed as business inclusion groups. But also, I think we're, you're, we're being challenged individually to think about what can we possibly do as individuals, because everyone can do something, which I think is brilliant. And I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points uh, there, Roy, as well, talking about the accommodation there. I mean, there's a lot of worry that accommodations for somebody are gonna, is going to cost like a huge amount of money. But actually, what that accommodation required was just some thought and some consideration. And, and a lot of times, that's what people need, some thought and some consideration. And it makes all of the difference, just thinking about the issues that are surrounding you. And then, Scott, as well, you one of the things that, that really struck me there, you were saying, tell people you have what it takes, you know, go, go and tell the people that you're supporting, you have what it takes um, to go forward in your career. And, and I think that's such an important thing and some, something that I think people forget to do as often as they should. I, I remember seeing one survey that of every 10 nice things people think about somebody else, they only pass on about one of them. So I think, you know, if you have a nice thought about somebody or, or you think that somebody's doing well in something, try to remember to do that and to pass it on because it can make all the difference to people's confidence um, when you're supporting people as an ally and, put, and trying to push them up the ladder, as, as we said. So thank you for all of those thoughts. Really, um, really thought provoking. Thank you. Um, so we had another question, which was, how can an organization like Reed Smith or the military um, actively encourage allyship and advocacy how can we um how can we encourage people to be thinking more about that and to be pushing more people up the ladder scott do you want to start with that i'll, I'll go with one that probably doesn't leap to everyone's mind right away and that is to help and encourage folks who are bucking the trends uh, who aren't necessarily in those positions that that we were privileged enough to be in uh, and i'll give you a good example a couple of good examples for, uh, one from the air force where a young flight surgeon had a guy who, uh, uh, an air, air crew member who had lost his leg. And in the Air Force, that's, you're done. You're gonna leave the military at that point. Uh, you know, and this is a little while ago, but still. Uh, and they, all the paperwork went through and he was gonna be discharged. And this flight surgeon is like, this is wrong. The guy is on a prosthetic. I've seen him, he still rides his, he lost it in a motorcycle accident. He still rides his motorcycle. He still is out there running. He's still doing all sorts of things. And he literally fought his way through and took this guy out to the flight line. And part of his duties included him climbing up on a C-130's wing and walking on the wing. And he brought they brought the ladder out and he set it up and he climbed up the ladder and he walked on the wing like he was supposed to. And the, the flight surgeon, you know, some captain, uh, an O3, you know, videotaped this whole thing and then sent it in and said, why did we say no to this guy? Where is he not doing his job? You know, and that would not have happened if colonels and a one star hadn't gotten involved and said, you know what, he's right. And uh, I guarantee, I wasn't involved directly in this case, but I guarantee along the way, there were plenty of people who said, what are you doing? You know, go do the stuff that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and, and so th that encouragement uh, of a guy who was kind of bucking the trend really worked. Uh, and a case that I was more directly involved with, um, we had a African-American uh, young lieutenant uh, young lieutenants uh, often are said to have unlimited number of stupid cards. And uh, our four star had visited the academy. He was a football player for the academy at the time and uh, had said, hey, if you ever need anything when you come on active duty, just email me. Well, he didn't really mean that, but the lieutenant didn't know that. Uh -huh. And so his first day on the job, he emailed uh, this four star and said, hey, I really wanted to be a pilot but I passed out once on the field in Colorado Springs and I have sickle cell trait. And so they said, well, that means you're symptomatic for your sickle cell and so you can never fly. Um, and people pass out on the Colorado Springs football field all the time. And one time uh, does not make a sickle cell uh, sim you know, symptom. And of course the typical medical system went through and said, well, he passed out, he's got sickle cell trait, he's, he's out. We got plenty of people trying to be pilots. And, um, and as four stars often do, they're like, hey, thanks for the email, and then sent it to me uh, <laughs> and said, hey, can you look into this? And when I looked into it, um, 
I, I went back to my four star. It's like, this is kind of ridiculous. And, you know, he had one time. They've done nothing to test this guy. He passes his PT test with 100 every year, 100%. And he does all sorts of other things. He played four years on the varsity football team. I think he can fly. And at the very least, he can fly in an aircraft where there's more than one pilot. And if he's starting to have a little bit of symptoms, the other pilot can you know, make sure the plane doesn't crash. Um, and so, oh my God, did I hear it from the medical community. You know, how dare you go outside of your lane and how, you know, you're betraying us and you're making us look bad. Uh, and that guy's a pilot now in the Air Force, but only after that four star, another four star, and the vice chief of the Air Force got involved uh, because the medical field dug their heels in so hard to say, no, this guy can't even fly a predator on the ground uh, because he passed out one time on the football field. So help those folks out that uh, are trying to buck the trends because uh, the system probably isn't going to help them uh, every step of the way. Thank you, Scott. Linda? So, I, again, be the change that you want to see in the world. Be the change. Um, I think I agree with what Scott said. Um, you have to dig down deep and be courageous. Um, I, I, when I was working for the United Nations, um, I became aware uh, late <coughs> in my time at the uh, one of the tribunals I worked at um, that one of the very senior officials at the institution was involved in sextortion. Um, individuals who were working at this tribunal um, could not go home to work in their home country after they worked for us because the tribunal was very much despised back in their home country. And if they had on their resume where they had been the previous three or five or eight years, they were not going to get employed in their home country. And so the goal for them was to work for 10 years and then apply for Dutch citizenship and become Dutch citizens and find employment in the Netherlands. Um, so at about the eight year point, this individual who was a very, very senior official um, would call in uh, the individuals and say, uh, I have to downsize one of two people uh, and what do you have to offer me that they don't? And he was not asking about writing skills. And it was obvious from the nature of the conversation. And I found out about this very late in my time at this tribunal. Um, and I got, I, I went in and I confronted him, eyeball to eyeball. I looked him in the, in the eye. It takes a lot of courage. I recommend going to the restroom before you do it and after you do it, okay? Because I sat down and I said, I've come to know that you're engaged in sextortion. And he said, what do you think you're going to do about it? So he said to me, <laughs> and I said, I'm getting on a plane, and I'm flying to New York, and I'm filing a complaint with the Office of Legal Affairs. How do you get an organization to change? You be the voice. You get on a plane. You fly to New York. You file a 27-page complaint like I did. And then when I got the message from the Under Secretary General of the United Nations for Human Resources saying that until I could get an affidavit from one of the victims signed by them, which I would not do because they would then be fired and there were no whistleblower protections, they said, then we won't investigate. And then I said, here's my response. I quit. I quit. Walked out on a six-figure job, no employment lined up, but I refuse to be part of that. And I refuse to be silent. And so I then went, because I didn't work for them anymore, right? I went on platforms because what? I've worked my way up in other organizations and they're willing to have me speak. And I spoke about it everywhere, everywhere. I spoke about it in Miami. I spoke about it in New York. I spoke about it in Argentina. I'm speaking about it here in Texas because I will not be silenced and the organization will change. So my urge to you when it's necessary is to be the change you want to see, be the voice. 
That, that's an incredible Thank story. You. What incredible courage it must have taken to do that. I mean, uh, what an example to everybody else in the room that is. That's amazing. Amazing. Uh, I think, you know, Scott and Linda had just given us, you know, the formula for, for change, right? For making things happen. It comes down to leadership. Each and every one has a capability to be a leader. And I like to break leader down into just some things that I personally believe are, are, are the critical components of, of being a good leader. Being well, There's no such thing as a bad leader. If you're a leader, you're supposed to be a good leader, right? And so think about the word leader and I break it down into love. Just hear me out here. Love, empathy, attentiveness, dignity, edification, and respect. You got to start with love. You got to start with care, really caring about people, because if you don't care, you're not going to do what they did and stand up for somebody. Right. And if you're a leader that doesn't care, you're not a leader. And you need to figure out how to become a good leader by caring about people, attentiveness, listening. Right. The, the general who received the letter who said, call me if you have any problems, had a choice. You just got an email. Do I do something with this or do I not? Right? He forwards it to a person who he knows is probably going to be taking action on it. No, he's attentive. He says, I've got a problem. I'm going to listen to this problem and see if there's anything that can be done and pushes that down. Linda was attentive to what was happening, right? And she took action about it because when you hear someone, you listen to them, you understand what their problem is. You figure, you try to figure out how to best help them. Sometimes it's not a solution that they're looking for, just someone to listen. But a lot of times there's something that you can do. So be attentive to people's problems. And, if, and um, treat people with dignity and respect. Everybody deserves to be treated with dignity, right? It's an inherent thing for all human beings. That's what we want. And that's what you want for yourself. So make sure that you are treating people with dignity. And that sometimes means standing up for others when they won't stand up or can't stand up for themselves, right? And then to edify someone is to lift them up, to bring them up. We talked about the ladder, right? Extending that hand to help somebody come up because there isn't always someone pushing from the other end, right? We need to be able to lift up others to help them overcome problems. And respect is something that we're all owed, right? You could lose respect by the way you act if you're not a good person, but we each and every one of us owes respect to the other person. And that means really looking out for them and taking care of them in every possible way that you can. And I think it all does come back to being a leader, taking care of people, no matter where you are. And the benefit of taking care of others is that you personally grow, right? This is about being human. It's about humanism, taking care of one another, regardless of where they came from, what they look like. In a business, in an organization, if you don't come together as a group and start taking care of one another, the organization doesn't do as well as it could. Those are my thoughts on that. I mean, that, that's, that's incredibly inspiring. And, you know, what, what a fantastic leader. I want to come on your ship. <laughs> I've got any spaces for British women, you know. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway. We'll build, a, we'll build a, a, our own ship. <laughs> no, well, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, I think just such great messages for whatever organization that you happen to be in and such great examples of, of leadership and great ambassadors, actually, um, for, for, for the military and, lead, and the leadership skills that the, the military has has in, has in there. So I think it's it's really amazing. And, and I think I'd also um, just like to pick up on a, the, the sort of theme of assumptions that I'm kind of hearing here from Scott. Um, for instance, talking about people assumed that the person with the prosthetic leg couldn't do the job. They assumed that somebody who'd had one incident um, of sickle cell, sickle cell anemia symptoms, therefore was unable to do the job. And then, Roy, people making assumptions that you're not you're not necessarily the captain because they, for whatever reason, they think you're too young or whatever it is. So it's a it's a really interesting theme, and I think. We often do um, live our lives working on assumptions and working on predictions, maybe, of what we think the, the room looks like and the people people will do or are. And I'm wondering what can we do, and this is not a question we prepared for, so, um, <laughs> so, but I'm wondering what can we do to sort of challenge those assumptions that, that we tend to make, people tend to make in their own heads? What can we do to try and stop ourselves making the, making the, the wrong assumption? I, I'd say that one thing that we have to do is keep saying it and keep talking about it. Because uh, if you talk about it at your yearly retreat, it, nothing's going to happen probably. If you talk about it every half year or a quarter, 
maybe a little bit. But if you're talking about it at most every meeting in some way, shape or form, it's just part of the organization. Uh, and I think that's a, a key part of it is it, it's and like they said today, you know, what the leader, uh, what the leaders watch, you know, people do, uh, you know, that's that's part of that, I think. And so the, I think that's a really important part of it is make it the same importance as the, all the other important things in your in your organization. Yeah, so I guess just kind of keep airing it, kind of keep talking about the fact that people are making these assumptions will make people stop and think before they, they do. Yeah, I think that's the key part is just making people think because uh, you don't know what their assumptions are always. People are really good at hiding some of that stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of us, myself included for sure, don't even know sometimes what our assumptions are. You know, my kids remind me all the time of, you know, geez, dad, that's not really good. And I'm like, hmm, I hadn't thought of it that way. And, and, and it's, you know, it's, that's, you know, they challenge me all the time and, and I welcome it. And I guess that's another part of it too, right? When people do challenge, you, you have to welcome that, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. Because if you start shutting people down, then, you know, that's the end of that. They're not going to challenge you anymore. So. Yeah. I think too, if you, um, it requires a shift in your own thinking. So when somebody came to you and said, um, how about if we add Sally to your team? Mm. What was your initial reaction with that statement? Yeah, but because mm. Sally's never been on your team before. And why has Sally never been on your team before? Yeah, but, and you have to change that thought in your own mind to what would Sally bring instead of yeah, but what would Sally bring? How would Sally change for the better, the dynamic of this group? What view might they bring? If you looked around this room and you were asked, pick out the person in the room that's a 30 year service veteran, hundred percent disabled. How many would have picked me? Your assumptions your assumptions. And then if I were, if, if you know now that I'm 100% disabled, how many of you think that it must, don't raise your hands, how many of you think, well, she must have a psychological disability or she must have been a victim of sexual assault in the military because I've read about it in the paper. I, I, I tell a funny story. I was in a group of very well-meaning individuals working on issues addressing homelessness of veterans. And um, I mentioned to them that what we needed were pro bono attorneys to represent veterans before the Court of Appeals for Veterans uh, Claims and before the, um, before the Board of Appeals, because they were talking about having pro bono volunteers to fill out the forms. And I said, no, that's not what we need. We need litigators who are willing to go to the court and to the board and to represent veterans. And so, and I was kind of vocal about it. And I asked at the point, you can't imagine me being vocal, right? <laughs> and so, I asked around the room, I said, how many of you in the room are veterans? Please raise your hand. And there were like two veterans in the whole room. And I said, so let me tell you something. We need veterans and we need pro bono lawyers who are willing to be litigators. And I know that takes more of your time, but that's what we need. And then I got up and I left the room as did everybody else. And when we got to the elevator, a gentleman who was with the mental health commission said, so how long have you suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder? And I was like, well, I probably do have some mental health challenges of which I would be equally proud, but none of those are rated because there's nothing wrong with having a mental health challenge that is rated for a disability. But why would you ask me a woman that and not ask the man next to me the same question? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Talk about assumptions. This was somebody in the room trying to do good making assumptions about what parts of my body were rated for disability without hearing a word about any of the things that were wrong with me. Challenge those assumptions. Stop asking, yeah, but, and instead change the thought in your head to what will they bring that'll make this stronger and better? Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much. Cool. That, that's a great point in the, in the we, we, I was at Naval Academy Diversity and Inclusion Conference, uh, I think it was last week. I sat at lunch with a midshipman, a young cadet, uh, who said, and I, and I asked them, 
does everyone have to come to the DNI? You know, there's a lot of nonsense going around in the media about how the academies are woke and they're pushing diversity and inclusion above all other things. And we're losing, you know, war fighting preparedness and readiness. Well, the Naval Academy Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Conference was open to all students who wanted to go. So the majority of the students who went, about 200 of them, chose to be excused from classes to attend, which meant the majority of the school did not attend. And I said, so why did you come to the DNI conference? And he said, we get so much mental stimulation with the classes and we get all this PT all the time, but nobody teaches us how to think about other people. It's important to have conferences where people get to talk about these things so that we become aware if we're not noticing things that are happening. We have to teach each other and learn from one another how to be better humans. If you remember back to college, those of us who went to college, right? How often were we having any of these conversations? In my school, never. And my school was 90% white because it was a Merchant Marine Academy. And the majority of the students that were Hispanic in the school, other than myself and another Puerto Rican kid, were from foreign countries. So those foreign students would look for people to connect with. And so it fell to my friend and I to be best friends, which is a great advantage because anytime I go to Panama, I have places to stay. Um, <laughs> but who talked to them? Who was looking out for them, for the foreign students and not pushing them away? So they would not want to become part of the United States one day, right? We went to New Orleans and some kid says, speak English, you're in America. I'm talking to my Panamanian friends, students from Panama who have come to the United States to learn here. And, you know, I turned around and I said, uh, Spanish was spoken in America well before English was. <laughs> uh, and my buddy was like, no, mira, déjalo. Because <laughs> like, that's who I am. <coughs> we have to learn how to treat one another, right? Sometimes it happens at home, but sometimes our parents are biased. And that's what we learn. And so how do we unlearn all those things? that come with us, the baggage that we carry around from wherever we were born, wherever we grow up. If there aren't conferences like this one, if the diversity, equity, and inclusion does not become a part of the normal conversation, it becomes a part of who we are. And we truly understand how to work with one another. If we don't know why a, a, a boardroom looks the way it does, just look at the network of the people that are in the boardroom. I'm gonna hire Scott, cause Scott's my friend. We're both, you know, retired military guys. Hey Roy, need a job. Hell yeah, come on in. Meantime, Linda was asking for the job, but I don't know Linda, right? I'm not even thinking the fact that Scott's another dude, right? And I don't have any women in my board. Equally qualified, colonels, right? Both. And yet, I'm going to default to the guy I know. That's why we are in the place that we are today. And we continue to be in that place because we do not make a conscious effort to truly understand what it means to truly be human to want to love and care for one another. Not just the buddy, my friend. So that's it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that it's interesting hearing you use the word human over and over again. And I also picked that up from what Scott was saying earlier in terms of leadership. Don't just go into, go into your office and not speak to anybody. Go out and be human, be seen and talk to people because I think that's what great leaders and great allies do. They gather information. You, you, you get more information, you understand um, your organization far better if you are human and you, and, and you interact with people than, than if you, you don't otherwise. So I think those are, those are some really, really good points. Thank you. Mm. Um, oh. Yeah, I believe that we have had a question. Um, we, we do have a question from uh, a viewer who is uh, a virtual viewer, and we are also open to questions here in the room. So the first question here is, how have you prevented bias and how has that experience become part of your being or part of your reality? Ben, if you want to jump in. With the... You know, I'm ready, but yeah. Let them go. <laughs> um, for me, it's, it's a matter of speaking up, of noticing, right? Saying, hey, this doesn't look right. Um, I told you about my police force. Uh, one day, uh, one of my police officers, my uh, senior police officers came to me and said, hey, Captain, we got a problem. I said, what's going on? I said, we had a, a young lady who was a police officer, a junior police officer, who had texted another police officer. Uh, she was active duty. He was uh, civilian police, federal police department. 
And uh, she texts him a picture of these two young men playing basketball and said, look at these monkeys playing in their natural habitat. You can picture that, right? And this is a, a young police woman, military police, sending it to another policeman who just happened to be sitting next to a black police officer, friend of his, opens his phone, opens it, listens to it. It's a message. The other policeman hears it. What do we do? I, I fired her. Sorry. And then we had a long chat with the policeman who received the text. She would not feel comfortable sending something like that to someone if he wasn't in on the, you know, nonsense. If he wasn't encouraging it or, you know, aiding and abetting, like we say. And so when we see something like that, we really do have to take action. We can't just say, oh, she's young. Oh, they're young. They don't know better. They're not, you know, prepared. You're an adult, 18 years old. Someone should have taught you better. And that's not the kind of thing that you spread around and start talking to people. You're, you're putting people down without knowing them. And it's not a joke. It is not funny. We grow up in, you know, societies where, where bullying used to be accepted. Now, I heard someone recently say, oh, all this stuff about bullying, we just all need to suck it up and grow up. No, we don't. Okay, I was abused as a child. I didn't need to suck it up and grow up with that. Did, did it form who I am today? Shape who I am today? Yes. It did, but it didn't need to happen. There's better ways to teach and help one another. And so we have to step up and, and, and stop the nonsense and say something direct there. Because that other person, when you don't say anything, it's encouraging the behavior. It's just saying it's okay. Just calm down. You're overreacting. No. Let's overreact. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll uh, say something here about constantly educate yourself <clears throat> and surround yourself by people who can educate yourself. And I'll, I'll tell an embarrassing story about myself. I was a new commander, relatively new commander, first time ever. And um, one of those young enlisted folks who learned to trust me had walked into my office and told me that someone had called him a name. Um, and to me, the name didn't mean anything. I was like, you know, how immature, um, you know, and I'll probably have to talk to that person or at least talk to their supervisor. But fortunately, I had mentioned it to my senior enlisted guy and said, you know, why would people do that, you know, in a professional environment that we're in? And he's like, holy cow, do you know what that means? And I'm like, it's rude. And he's like, no, it's way worse than rude. And it turned into a huge issue that uh, we've eventually pursued legal matters for it. And it was my ignorance that, you know, where, where I had grown up, that was not a term that apparently we had used, but this person um, had. So I learned something that day. Uh, and it was two things. One was I knew, learned a new word, but I also learned that sharing uh, experiences with other people can be incredibly invaluable and uh, be receptive to hearing, oh, no, you've, you've interpreted that wrong. And, uh, and so it led to a very different uh, result. And they could have been totally screwed up. And, uh, and instead, you know, this person learned, oh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Calder doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't help people um, when they need help. So, mm -hmm. so um, I had the privilege of being a judge in the U.S. military for 10 years. When I came to the bench, I mentioned that I was one of only two women in the entire Air Force who was on the bench. Uh, while I was in the Air Force, I made a concerted effort to try to get women to come to the bench. And one of the reasons that there weren't many women on the bench is that by that time we were allowed to have kids and stay on active duty if we applied and could prove that we could take care of them. Um, and um, so there was an increased number of women on the bench when I left versus the number that were on the bench when I came. Uh, Ten years later, there were a lot more. But I had occasion when I was a, um, before I became a chief circuit judge, um, that I was in an office where I was the only woman judge and the, everybody else in the office was also a judge. Now, think for yourself what you think a judge ought to be, fair, impartial, knowledgeable of their own biases, making sure that they set them aside, making sure that every person that comes before them gets a fair and impartial hearing. But you never know what happens in the judges' chambers unless you've worked there. You never know. Now, we had no law clerks, and this is not a law clerk story. I was a judge. And I'm sitting in my office with all the other five men who were judges in the office, 
And all five of the men were in the office next to mine laughing hysterically. And I thought to myself, why am I not invited at the party? Diversity, equity, inclusion demands that I walked in and asked, why am I not at the party? Everybody's having such a good time. I'd like to be <laughs> there. And so I walk in and it happens that we had a female that shared the area with us who was the circuit chief circuit defense counsel. That meant she was responsible for supervising all the defense counsel in that region. Okay. And so she happened to overhear this conversation when I walked in and I said, what's so funny, am I invited? And they all looked at one another sheepishly and they said, well, the new advance sheet that just came out from uh, the uh, military justice reporter system has a decision for every woman who's currently on the bench. That's very unusual because there weren't that many of us, but this particular advance sheet had a decision that issued some ruling on every woman who was on the bench. And one of the judges said to me, it's sort of like the Playboy edition of the advance sheets. And then to make it just a little worse, opened it up to the center and turned it sideways and said, the centerfold isn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, my reality, my everyday experience. So I said immediately, which I thought showed great presence of mind, but you know, whatever. And I said, well, I may not think that that's too offensive, but the other woman judge who happened to be six foot one and fixed her own plumbing and did her own roofing um, might sit on you mm -hmm. if she heard you say that. And then I walked out, which was a bit of deflection, but it enabled me to address it immediately and then walk out. Well, it happened that the female chief circuit defense counsel had overheard this conversation. She came in my office and she said, what are you gonna do about this? And I'm thinking to myself, why me again? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. If there are those of you in the room who think, why me again? I often have felt like, why me again? And the answer is because there isn't anybody else. There isn't anybody else who's going to have the courage, like Roy has, like Dr. Calder has. There's nobody else who's going to have the courage to say, this guy can fly, or I need to fire this person. There's nobody else. It's you. And so... I put a note in the chief, the chief circuit judge's box. He was in the room and said nothing when that happened. And I said, you know, I'm either all the way in or all the way out, and I'm happy to be reassigned if I'm not all the way in. But I'm not going to tolerate being treated this way. And then I left, and I went to the chief trial judge's office, which happened to be at the same base. And I went and had a little chat with him. And I did what I know those of you in the room who do this work have heard before. I said, please don't say anything. How many times have you heard that? Please don't say anything. I want to try to handle this myself, but I need to report this to you. Okay. You have a choice when somebody comes in and says, please don't say anything about this because you either need to follow up and make sure that they've handled it themselves, or in my opinion, you become the enabler because you've been told and they don't have the courage to follow through. But I said that, just like everybody does. Please don't say anything, but I was sexually harassed at the water cooler at the office party. Or they, we, we all say it. I'm sorry, we all say it. We've all had somebody say it to us. And the question is, did you follow up? So I go over to this colonel's office, chief trial judge's office, and I say, please don't say anything. This is what happened. I'm not going to tolerate it. What do you want me to do, Linda? I said, I'm going to take care of it, and you know I will. And so I got back to the office about 20 minutes later, and the chief trial judge had read my letter, or the chief circuit judge had read my letter, and he said, Linda, I read your letter, and I, I have a plan, but who else did you tell? And I said, it's none of your business who else I told. And I said, but the mere fact that you're worried about who else I told tells you something about what you should have done in the room when this happened. And I said, and so one by one, in marched every one of the men, trial judges. And I, took, I couldn't help but say, you're a judge for God's sake. You need to act like a judge. And that includes in the office. And it better never happen again. 
And I have to say the result of that was one of the guys that was in there and I spent the most time with became an absolute advocate, became known as the DEI specialist for the Air Force after I left and really took that to heart and made a difference. So I hope that answers the viewer's question, but um, that's an example of how they can make a difference. You, you know, you mentioned uh, a really important point there is that the leader in the room didn't say anything. It, and that starts really young in your career. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't it, do, it doesn't suddenly happen because you're a commander or you're, you know, the senior most person or whatever. It, it starts when you're a peer. And mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you, I'm a reformed introvert. I'm still an introvert, but I, the military made me look like an extrovert. And so it terrified me when I felt like, oh, man, that's wrong. I should I should say something here. And, you know, let, I'll be honest, I didn't early in my career. And as I got a little bit older, I started realizing, oh, man, that's really out of bounds. I'll say something. And that first time, it's terrifying. And the second time, it's a little less terrifying. And the third time, it's not really that terrifying. And so it, it's like everything else. You build muscle memory of it, and it just becomes who you are. Uh, and, you know, do they just get better around you? I don't know, but, you know, it, hopefully at least you're making little changes every time you do that. And, and, you know, Scott, I have to say, it was okay with me if the reason that they changed when I was in the room is because they were afraid of me. I was good with that. I'm sorry, I was good with that. Whatever it takes to make the change, I'm good with that. If they knew I was going to call them out, I'm good with that. And you're at least making them think about it, because before they didn't even think about it. I mean, crime and E, when I was in Italy, I'm a colonel in Italy, and we still had centerfolds on the walls in flight rooms. And it was a huge deal that we had to inspect those areas to take them down. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is 2014, I think. It was, yeah, if I remember no, right. that's, 2015, that's quite late. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's bizarre how long this stuff goes on. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panel all of you attending in person and everyone attending virtually. Um, I know that you probably have tons more questions for our speakers so you can catch them at lunch. Um, you've all had tips for all of us to implement individually as organizations. And thank you so much. It's been truly inspirational to, to meet and to hear from all of you. I have to give you all a, a little housekeeping message, which um, is that please do, uh, if you're in person, uh, go out, enjoy lunch back in the ballroom and remember to come back uh, to the ballroom for the keynote presentation at 12.30. And if you're listening virtually, uh, you can exit this meeting room and re-enter, click on the uh, keynote presentation, and that will begin at 12.30. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. <laughs>